Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio. Brought to you by OnPay, Atlanta's new standard in payroll. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here, another episode of Atlanta Business Radio, and this is going to be a good one. But before we get started, it's important to recognize our sponsor, on pay. Without them, we could not be sharing these important stories. Today on Atlanta Business Radio, we have Robert Ballantyne with Ballantyne Wealth Management Company and also the author of the book, First Generation Wealth. Welcome, Robert. Welcome, Lee. Well, I'm excited to learn what you're up to. Tell us about your firm. How are you serving folks? Well, we are a Atlanta-based wealth management firm that tend to work with entrepreneurs in transition. Our clients have entrusted us with today over $5 billion of assets. We have offices in Atlanta and one in Raleigh, North Carolina. And our clients are increasingly focused not just on money management, but on really sustaining the wealth that they've created and spending it into a meaningful legacy for their children and their children's children and beyond. Now, um, your industry has always fascinated me uh, because folks are trusting you to kind of be the steward or, or help them kind of get the most out of their wealth. Um, and that's a, that's a high bar of trust that you have to kind of work through. How has, from a cultural standpoint, how have you been able to um, be this successful? Like, what are you doing, you know, to help people trust you quickly to ensure that they're going to reach the objective that they are, you know, striving to reach? Well, there's an old saying that uh, trust but verify. And I think uh, one of the things that's allowed us to achieve whatever modicum of success we've been able to achieve, frankly, is the business model. At Ballantyne, we operate as a fiduciary, meaning that we don't accept commissions or fees uh, for products or proprietary placement of things, but really truly being able to sit on the same side of the table as the client. And I think the reason entrepreneurs are attracted to us because we are they. Uh, we've taken risk. Uh, we've built businesses. We've sold a company. We ran a division of a public company. And then a dozen years ago, 17 of us spun back out on our own to create the uh, legacy business that my father and I established 35 years ago. So really understanding the DNA of the entrepreneur and the difference between uh, taking risks, building an operating business, monetizing it, and then really investing it in order to be able to meet whatever objectives the client sets forth. That's what they're looking for us to help them do. So now are your clients coming uh, from just primarily referrals, like other successful business people say, hey, this is who I use, so this is who you should use? Or are you kind of able to attract maybe younger entrepreneurs who are at the beginning of their entrepreneurial journey so that you're kind of with them through the whole ride? Well, the, the clientele we work with tend to be uh, a little older simply because we have a $5 million threshold uh, for assets under management in order to become a client. Uh, it's not typical that uh, entrepreneurs starting off uh, have that, have that kind of liquidity, but it's really been a word of mouth business. Uh, I've always believed if you take care of your clients, they'll refer their friends to you. And, you know, I'm most proud that our client retention rate has always, has always been in the high 90s. We also get a lot of business from uh, centers of influence, from estate planning attorneys, from accountants, from investment banks uh, that are referring their clients to us, as well as speaking engagements and uh Frankly, just just showing up, having uh, having a good reputation in Atlanta over the last thirty five years. Now, when you're working with firms of that size, five million, in, or, or people have assets of five million or more, that typically, I would imagine, means that they're switching from somebody to you. Um, like, what is the reason that that switch occurs? Well, it's generally not as much dissatisfaction with an existing advisor as that there is money in motion. And that money in motion typically is when they sell the operating company that they started. Uh, in some instances, sadly, it's uh, death or divorce where people inherit money. Uh, but more times than not, it's 
clients feeling like they've reached a, a different level where they need a different level of advice, uh, where they need conflict-free advice delivered by senior people. But with the M&A that's uh, M&A activity that's taken place, uh, the low cost of money, the multiples being paid for businesses today, uh, the fact that larger companies that are not able to grow their top line as quickly as they can through acquisition are reaching down into the lower middle market, acquiring businesses is creating a lot of liquidity. That and simply the demographics, the baby boomers that are moving towards retirement and that are deciding to uh, cash in their life's work by selling their companies. Now, you mentioned that your organization is an entrepreneurial organization, and one of the choices you decided uh, to make was to make it employee-owned. Can you talk about how that decision came about? Well, the first business that uh, that I started 35 years ago actually uh, grew to become the largest investment counseling firm in the South. We had about $4 billion under management. That's when, uh, back in the early 2000s, a lot of Northeastern firms figured out there was money south of the Mason-Dixon line, as I say. Uh, and within two years, uh, large national firms uh, started coming to Atlanta and acquiring local firms. And uh, we we sold the majority of our equity to a New York Stock Exchange uh, listed company and uh, ran their investment business for the next seven years before we decided that really investment advice we found uh, was most credible when it was delivered in an employee-owned organization where uh, our partners invest 100% of their money right alongside of their clients. Uh, I think it's important to eat your own cooking. Um, and I think uh, creating an environment where motivated people flourish by being able to set the culture is something that really can only be done in an employee owned organization where uh, the decisions that you make are your own. That doesn't mean they're always going to be good decisions, but they are your own decisions and you you have a little bit more control over your fate or destiny as opposed to uh, working for a large behemoth or a corporation that is uh, trying to generate earnings uh, on a short-term basis. Wealth management inherently is a long-term endeavor. And it's not something that I think easily falls within the uh, Wall Street analyst's fixation on quarter-to-quarter -quarter numbers. Amen to that. Amen to that. Now, um, in your career of kind of working with entrepreneurs at, at a level where they've kind of made it to some degree where they have kind of financial security at that, is there a kind of a tipping point where people go, okay, I have enough now. And I'm, I'm now thinking about how to pass this on and have a legacy that lives longer than me in this entity. I've done a lot of work interviewing a lot of family businesses, for example, and typically a family business, you know, maybe it's two or three generations, at least in America. I mean, I know in Europe, some, there are some family businesses that are, you know, 500 years old, but in America, it's typically a couple generations and then it kind of peters out. Uh, do you find that that's something that the entrepreneur is striving for? Or is that kind of, we're like kind of the nouveau riche when it comes to this, that we don't have those obviously 500 year old companies, but that it's, a, it's um, more of a challenge in America. Well, it's very rare that a business survives into the second generation and rarer still uh, that it gets into the third generation and beyond. Uh, wealth expert Dr. Dennis Jaffe in California wrote a book uh, a couple of months ago uh, called The 100-Year Family. And he interviewed families that had been successful for more than a century, not necessarily that the business was still operating, but that the family uh, kept the money together through a family office or uh, some type of, of combined entity. And the one thing that he discovered that was the common characteristic among those families that survived that long was communication. Because what we've seen working with uh, wealthy families over the last four decades or so mm -hmm. is that there is a difference between the family business and the business of the family. And oftentimes, the first generation that's creating the wealth is so 
headlong into simply survival mode. Uh, as you well know, Lee, the highs of the entrepreneur are, are generally higher and the lows are a lot lower. Uh, but there does come a time when all of a sudden they realize that they've created what we call generational wealth. In other words, wealth that's going to outlive them and in, 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 in their immediate family. And that's generally the catalyst when uh, the family starts thinking about uh, who are we besides our money? And how do we raise children in a family of affluence without depriving them of the joy that comes from earning a living? You know, there's an old saying, uh, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. And it really doesn't matter which culture. Uh, it's a saying that's been, uh, was first posited by the Muslim scholar Ibn Khaldun in the 13th century about uh, the Bedouins who leave the desert and build a palace and you grow up in the palace and you know nothing but the life of luxury and all of a sudden uh, hard work goes away and the money evaporates and you're back out in the desert again. And so what we've seen is the importance for families to be intentional about thinking through who they are besides their money, uh, because after all, money can't buy happiness. And w when you talk about generational wealth, is that a number or is it a mindset? I think it's really more of a mindset. Uh, you know, people that somebody that makes $100,000 a year and spends $80,000 a year is generally a lot happier uh, than the person earning a million dollars a year that's spending a million too. Um, and I think it really, it, it's that uh, satisfaction of feeling that you have enough uh, to take care of your family, uh, that you have enough uh, to do the things that you want to do and different people for different people. That's, that's a different amount of money. Um, but we find the more happy clients are thinking about how can we use our wealth to really make a difference in the lives of others, whether it's their, their own family, but more often than not uh, through philanthropy. So now when you're kind of broaching that conversation with folks, is this, um, are you kind of laying everything out, the, the kind of the numbers and saying, hey, it looks like you have enough, you know, on the spreadsheet and projections. And, you know, obviously those are kind of um, you're kind of projecting. So they're not based on truth. They're kind of what you historically have found to be true. And then you say, OK, now it's time to think about, you know, a bigger why. Are they, are they kind of starting from a blank sheet of paper there or do they already have some idea of, you know, knowing this now, I think that I would like to help, you know, my community or I would like to help, you know, poor people in another country or whatever their cause is. Do you help them kind of think through kind of the trade offs of, of building out some sort of an infrastructure that helps kind of keep their legacy going and help those that uh, folks that are important to them? Yes, I think uh, a lot of people have what we call the magic number. And that's how much money do I need to have before I retire? If I can just get to whatever the amount of money is, will be set. Uh, what we try to do is to look at planning as an iterative, more dynamic process. And uh, look at it in kind of five-year increments because it's very difficult when a, a young couple in their 30s or 40s raising children or saving money, they may have uh, a certain amount of money that they think they need to have before they retire, but life gets in the way. Uh, people get married, people fall apart, uh, grow apart, uh, children are born, uh, addiction issues come in, healthcare issues come in, businesses fail, new businesses are born. And so I think it needs to be really kind of an iterative process, but often people have a pretty good sense of uh, it, in their latter days, uh, how they want to be identified and, and really what they want their money to do. But it's something that we encourage people to be thinking about all along life's journey, not just once I hit age 65 and I retire, now what do I do? People need something to retire to, uh, not retire from. And then as part of your work in helping them kind of create that machine that helps 
um, their wealth kind of live on and serve this other kind of higher purpose? Yes, is since most of the clients that we work with are business owners, they understand that the way to become wealthy is to concentrate and take risk. Our goal is to help them understand the way to stay wealthy is to diversify. And so much of that really has to do with the behavioral aspects of moving from being CEO or founder of a business where you can work harder, you can fire, you can acquire, you can divest, you feel some semblance of control. When you've sold your company and you're uh, investing money broadly across different asset classes in public markets like stocks or bonds or in private markets like private equity and real estate, there's a certain sense of loss of control. Um, as Warren Buffett says, nobody has a sign in front of their house flashing the value every day. Uh, but in the stock market, you have a, a value printed at 4 p.m. every day. And so part of our job is to help these clients understand that the way great wealth is preserved is to be sure that it's invested wisely uh, and that they have the patience that allows capital markets to work to generate a rate of return that allows them to sustain their lifestyle and still take care of taxes and fees and inflation. But at the end of the day, investment management is really more about the management of risk than it is the management of return. Now, in your book, First Generation Wealth, um, I think we've touched on some of the things that it covers, but what was kind of the catalyst to kind of document maybe some of the things that you have learned over the years? Well, the goal of the, uh, the book, First Generation Wealth, that uh, my partner, our CEO, Adrian Kranje, and I uh, co-authored was really to kind of synthesize what we've learned over decades of working with families uh, to help them identify uh, what's important in the family and how to avoid some of the pitfalls that surround first-generation wealth, the shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves phenomena that we talked about. Uh, understanding the difference between the business and the business of the family, and really importantly, seeing the world through the next generation's eyes. We've seen so many instances where matriarchs or patriarchs expect their children to follow in their footsteps in the family business uh, when they have no interest at all in doing that, and how to have really healthy uh, family financial relationships. Because we live in a financially illiterate society, you know, things like compound interest and um, how to invest and how to save and how to avoid student debt, credit card debt, all of that. That's not something that's typically taught in schools. And there's a saying that the money line runs very close to the heart line. And when you are working with these families, uh, you really understand what's important to them. I'm thinking of a situation uh, the other day with a family with whom we're working that has a third generation family business. The son, the, the grandson is running it. He wants to take the profits and plow them back into the business to expand. His sister who doesn't work in the business, but who owns half the business uh, is a working mom married to a high school football coach and she wants distributions from the business. So how do we reconcile that inevitable tension? Uh, between uh, people that own part of a family business but maybe don't work there. And actually working with this family, we're able to have the brother buy out the sister so the sister has her assets and can do what she wants to do. And the brother can continue to grow the business and they can uh, be happy seeing one another over the dinner table at Thanksgiving. Yeah, I mean, I think that the challenges of family businesses are unique and that people who aren't part of family businesses really don't understand some of those dynamics. Uh, right. And um, it's like you said, that that sounds good at that point, but what happens in 10 years if this person's now a, a billionaire and then the sister isn't and uh, the sister's family is struggling for whatever reason? So then, I mean, tension can appear in lots of different places in family businesses. Clearly. 
Now, um, when you're working with your folks, and you you mentioned and you said the, you know, you're using the words wealth and you're using the words legacy. I I, I think when you're helping somebody kind of think through their legacy, and like in this case that so you were describing this family business, the legacy might mean different things to different people. I think you mentioned that communication is really critical when it comes to this. It's important to get everybody kind of on the same page so that at least we're all kind of aiming at that same true north. How do you help people kind of talk through the trade-offs of different decisions that they might be making? Well, it really comes down to uh, to communication. Some days I feel like uh, my partners at Ballantyne are really wealth psychologists, uh, not just helping clients uh, make good investment decisions, but really getting them to talk uh, through a series of exercises that we've developed uh, to be sure that all voices are heard to create uh, an environment where it's safe to talk about money. Money in a lot of families is taboo. Uh, And being able to be transparent and to have honest conversations. And part of the reason we wrote the book, First Generation Wealth, was to give them a roadmap of how to have some of these conversations. Yeah, I think um, everything is kind of easier when there's a bull market like there is now. Um, when the stock market kind of was trending up and it seems like it's going up and up and up, everything sounds great. When there is some sort of, um, you know, a downturn, then everybody, you know, might not feel the same psychologically. I think money is, it's a tricky subject and a lot of people see this as something that only goes up. And when there's periods of time when it doesn't always go up and there's unique challenges for every generation, I mean, now the stock market is going up, but now like interest rates are so low, there's kind of no safe haven, uh, you know, for for money nowadays. So it's tricky to kind of navigate this stuff. How do you help people kind of manage these ups and downs? I mean, I know long term, historically, the facts are the facts. Historically, if you're, you know, invested, you should do okay. But if you need the money today, tomorrow, in a year, two years, three years, it gets trickier. You know, the deaccumulation of the money is a, a different challenge than the accumulation of the money. No, you're you're exactly right, Lee, and that's why I said a while ago uh, the essence of investment management is really managing risk uh, before return. And the way we try to mitigate risk is not just through uh, broad portfolio diversification, but to be sure clients have a margin of safety in their portfolio. And that typically means that we want clients to keep in cash uh, a couple of years of spending net of portfolio yield. So whatever dividends and interest are being thrown off, uh, most clients, because interest rates, as you point out, are so low, are generally, if they're retired, spending from their portfolio at a higher rate uh, than what the 10-year treasury affords today at 1.3% or what the dividend yield on the S&P is, which is less than 2%. The way you're able to spend more than that, of course, is through appreciation. So you've got to have at least a couple of years worth of spending net of portfolio yield. That means if you have a portfolio throwing off $250,000 a year of income, but you're spending twice that, then you need to have $500,000 in cash, two years worth of spending. And the reason for that is our research shows that, that you know, the typical bear market uh, is from, uh, or the typical business cycle is really, uh, the down cycle is not going to run more than a couple of years. So you need to have some dry powder so that you're not forced to sell something when markets turn down, because that creates permanent impairment of capital. You have to have a long-term outlook. I'm not smart enough to know what the market's going to do this year or next year. But I can be pretty accurate when I when we uh, take today's starting point and forecast out uh, seven years or so. And that is why uh, part of the work that we do is behavioral. So in March of last year, when COVID was at its peak and markets dropped 30%, 
our clients, frankly, weren't that worried because they knew they had that margin of safety and therefore they didn't panic and sell. But if you sold last year because you were scared when markets dropped 30%, you've missed a 100% rebound uh, in the ensuing 18 months. Yeah, and that's uh, it's that long-term thinking and always kind of keeping your eye on that ball and not kind of getting hung up on today's headlines. Exactly. So now um, in the book, uh, First Generation Wealth, uh, you talk about these three principles of, uh, you know, don't mistake wealth for legacy, distinguishing between the business and the business of family and seeing the world through the next generation's eyes. Are you finding that um, that people are using this book as kind of that playbook so that they can have these conversations or maybe they give the book to their kid and say, hey, you know what, let's read this so we can have a conversation. It's a good conversation starter. Like how are people using the book in order to have these? These could be kind of tricky situa- tricky conversations with family members because like you said, some are in the business, some are not, some have no desire to even know about it, and just want to check. I mean, they all have different needs and desires. It really has to do with... Uh with communication and what we've seen uh, so many of our clients uh, and friends do with the book is read it and then get other family members to read it and then sit down and have a conversation. Because to me, uh, as a lifelong learner, it needs to be this uh, iteration of, of continuous learning where we don't all have the answers, but as we are all together on this, great journey called life, we've got to be willing to be intentional and sit down and have conversations about it. Even uh, a lot of family members tend to uh, think about some of the concepts that we've outlined in the book, if at all, maybe once a year after Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, They're not as intentional about sitting down and talking about it. And to me, it really needs to start early. Good financial stewardship, good financial habits need to be taught early. Um, it's not too early uh, to, tar- to start teaching three and four-year-olds concepts about responsibility and uh, the concept of gratitude uh, because our clients typically aren't living in, in the real world. Uh, you know, they tend to be families of great affluence and they understand that they have a responsibility to give back to the communities from which they earn their living and to teach their children good financial stewardship. And the book has been a real catalyst uh, to begin teeing up those conversations. Now, do you find that first generation people with first generation wealth have a difficult time with their kind of children, their, you know, the next generation in terms of you trying to prevent them from maybe some of the hard times that you went through, but you don't want to make it too easy. So they appreciate this and have, you know, kind of the work ethic that you needed in order to achieve what you achieved. Like, is that, that seems like a difficult uh, road for some folks to really transfer, to be generous and protect the kid, but also give them, you know, kind of some skin in the game too. Well, I think it's human nature that we want our children to have it better than we did. If, if granddad walked a mile in the snow to school every day and, you know, dad rode the bus and we're riding, you know, we're in a carpool, you know, the next generation might expect a chauffeur to pick them up in the morning and drop them off. We all, we want to make it easier for our children. That's the, the bias that we have to nurture, but there is value that comes from struggle. And I've always been a big believer that you should give your children enough that they can do anything, but not so much that they can do nothing. So one of the biggest concerns our clients have is how do I teach my children the benefit of delayed gratification and struggle? And from the children's standpoint, oftentimes they feel guilty if they inherit a lot of money, um, I've been in, in meetings where they, they actually express agony that some dead relative that made a lot of money that they never met uh, is, allows them not to work. Uh, and they have low self-esteem and they have a low self-image. Or uh, in other cases, they feel entitled. And I think the, the challenge for parents 
is to not continue to rescue their children and give them everything, but teach them the value that comes from earning a living. You know, it's, it's not a good thing to give your daughter a brand new car when she turns 16. It might be a good thing to match every dollar that she earns on her own from babysitting or working in a store or something towards buying a used car uh, when she's 16 so that she feels ownership of something as well. Those are little things, practical things that we can do to teach good financial habits to our children. Well, if somebody wants to learn more about Ballantine, uh, the firm, or uh, get a hold of this book, First Generation Wealth, what's the website? Uh, the website is www.ballantine.com, uh, or you can go to www.firstgenerationwealth.com. The book's available on Amazon. Uh, and we would certainly be, able, be uh, delighted to uh, answer questions or help any of your listeners. Well, Robert, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're doing important work and we appreciate you. Thank you, Lee. It was a pleasure speaking with you today. All right. This is Lee Cantor. We'll see you all next time on Atlanta Business Radio. 